Hi, I'm Ali Perti, fashion and lifestyle journalist and editor of Zayla Magazine. I've always been interested in biographies and in the stories of people's lives, basically listening to what stirs their souls. Welcome to the soulful side of life, where I let you in on some of my conversations with inspiring people from around the world in fashion, faith, entertainment, music, and entrepreneurship. These are conversations that stir the soul about people's journeys, about the ups and downs of life, and how they have overcome certain situations. I hope that these episodes will inspire your life in some way, so enjoy over a cup of something hot or on your drive to work. This is The Soulful Side of Life and can be found on Spotify Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. Maria de Medeiros is Portuguese, but grew up in Austria and has lived in France for many years. She's an actor, director, and singer, mainly partaking in European productions, but also she does American films. She got her big break in Hollywood, firstly with the film Henry and June in 1990 and with Pulp Fiction in 1994. I first met Maria during Paris Fashion Week in September 2023 at an art exhibition during the February-March 2024 Women's Paris Fashion Week. I got to sit down with her and what a privilege it was in St. Germain, uh, that's the neighborhood in Paris, to talk about being a citizen of Europe, how acting found her and what it was like working with Quentin Tarantino for Pulp Fiction. So enjoy this podcast episode, pardon the phone ringing in the background, but nonetheless, enjoy it. And I hope that you take away something that you can apply to your life. Well, Maria, thank you so much for joining the podcast. It's a pleasure. Um, Okay, so my first question is, you're a third culture kid, meaning you were born in Portugal, but you were raised in Vienna, Mm -hmm. and then now you live in France. So being a third culture kid, does that impact how you view the world? I guess it it does. Uh, It it really uh, made me a citizen of of Europe and of the world, and and I'm always interested uh, about what's on the other side and the, the other language and the other perspective and it, it was very interesting when I was a child that we often uh, we were living in Vienna in Austria but we were going on holiday to Portugal and often we would make the trip uh, by car mm. with my mother driving and 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 that means you drive through which countries? Uh, um, Austria, Italy, okay. uh, fr- France, Spain, Portugal. Wow! And she was <laughs> very impressive because she she was kind of a, a, a language language genius, <laughs> and uh, she would we would cross the border because there were still borders. And uh, whoa, she would switch <laughs> language, and and that really trained our ears in my ears, and so I really loved the, the playing with different languages. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it, it it was a strong print, <laughs> yeah. and uh, something I noticed very interesting over the years is that. Um, Somehow, when you change language, you change a little bit your personality. Mm. Uh, you're driven to, because actually every language represents a certain perspective, a certain attitude towards reality. Mm. So you're forced to become someone else slightly mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> when you change language. For instance, uh, uh, I would say that. French drives you to a certain rationality, a certain way of, of perceiving relationships in the world. Mm. Uh, this, 
uh, Spanish. Spanish has has uh, a some, passion, a passion so, something that may appear as a little bit brutal. Actually, it's not, but but because it's very direct. Uh, and so you have to assume that position of being very direct and addressing people very directly. And I think it's lovely. Italians with that, that beauty of the language and, and uh, it's precisely the opposite because it's, it's, it's all about surrounding the other with poetry. <laughs> then of course we do our own interpretations but but uh, yeah, this this uh, relationship to different cultures is has since I was very small become very important for me. Right, and it's interesting you say that because I've lived in nine countries, but I only speak English, mm -hmm. a little Spanish, because I took that in school. But Which I've countries noticed, did you live in? Uh, U.S., Spain, U.K., Germany. France, Italy, the UAE, I count Saudi because I uh -huh. spent over a month there once, and Lebanon. Wow. And though I can't speak any of these languages except the UK and buy <laughs> a little bit with some Spanish in Spain, um, I've noticed how in each of these places I live, how people express themselves. With hands, some mm -hmm. cultures use hands. Yeah. Um, I I feel like the Spanish you said a directness, and that's interesting. I, I'm not fluent in Spanish, so I don't know what you mean by that. But I also I feel when I look at them, how they communicate. There's this personalness to the language, maybe because of, they use their hands, and mm -hmm. the way Arabs can be very in your face it, it seems but they're speaking just maybe about bread or water or something ah. that's very normal but you know like you know <laughs> they, they use the hands or right. you know like it's a it's a language i feel arabic that talks at you not with you oh, some of the times and then the way you can see in a souk in a market how they are talking to you and then they'll put their hand on your shoulder and mm. we don't communicate that way yeah. English, but also oh well <laughs> but also um i think they are direct because they they're very you know masculine yes region in the world so i guess what i'm trying to say is it's a beauty to the personality of languages yes and how yes um, absolutely and but it's funny because for a while i i thought that maybe the, the gesture language would be universal it's absolutely not yeah <laughs> it's very funny i saw recently um beautiful theater show with uh, and by Isabella Rossellini ah, yes. uh, it's called some, something about Darwin uh, uh, dear Mr. Darwin uh, it's beautiful beautifully uh, written and performed and it, it is about animals and the Darwin theory now the smile Darwin's smile I think okay. but, but I'm not sure I have to Anyway, um, it's all about our relationship with animals and her relationship and, uh, that's very strong with uh, the animal. But she, th there's a whole part about the Italian gestures because mm -hmm. <laughs> they have very precise meanings and if you're not Italian you, you don't have a clue. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like wondering what do they mean? Yeah. And, and I feel with the Romance languages Americans, maybe Brits, I don't know about South Africans and Australians, but we like our space, Americans, and the Spanish like to be close when they talk to yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. And we're like backing away. Yes. <laughs> like, you can stay over there, I'm over here, I totally understand, I can hear you, I understand what you're saying, but um, it's just fascinating. It is. I remember um, when I lived in Spain with a family in 2009, 
um, my host father was saying how the Portuguese tend to have a better understanding of Spanish without maybe even studying it mm. versus Spanish who... Absolutely. Yeah. The Portuguese, are, uh, I'm Portuguese, yeah. uh, are one of those uh, people who always traveled. You know, they, they crossed the world and they were the first in Japan and uh, they really they were big, big mm -hmm. uh, uh, seamen. The first in the Americas, right? Uh, yes. Before Columbus? Uh, yes. Um, and, and certainly that there's uh, uh, Magellanes that uh, mm -hmm. went around the, the world mm -hmm. uh, for the first time and Vasco da Gama, big, big discoverers. Mm -hmm. And then, but we, we kept that thing with the sea and with the traveling because we have, we had for many years a lot of um, immigration also all over the world. There are yeah. Portuguese communities and, um, and we love languages. We love, uh, many foreigners who go to Lisbon say it's very difficult to learn Portuguese because they don't allow you to. <laughs> because they, immediately jump into your own language and, and, and try to please you speaking your own language. I see, I see. <laughs> um, I heard that if you can speak more than one language, you have a higher emotional intelligence versus if you just speak one language. <clears throat> Would you agree with that? And does that, if you have, or if you agree with that, do you feel that as an actor, you are able to relate to characters or jump into characters yes. more easily because you speak Yes, I, I, I certainly agree with that because I was, as I was telling you, the, the, the changing of language already implies a certain change of character too, and and the entering someone else's language uh, is is a form of empathy. Mm -hmm. um, I love translation, also written translation, and I think translation is one of the biggest acts of love. You know, because when you translate, you completely go or try to go in, 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 into someone else's um, universe, expression, emotions. So, yeah, I think in, in the crossing of languages, always a lot of emotion lies there. Yeah. <laughs> um, when did you know acting was your calling? <laughs> Actually, it was... Uh, quite a surprise for me because I always thought I would do fine arts. I was one of those children, you know, drawing, drawing all the time. And um, there was a very important Portuguese director, João César Monteiro, um, very crazy, gifted and crazy. And I always say he's guilty of my career because <laughs> he really took me into uh, cinema as I was very young, 15 years old. I was the main character in his film Silvestre and it was a big, uh, a, a big uh, discovery for me, the uh, uh, cinema, you know, I, I was very attracted to to um, perform, of course, mm -hmm. I had I had a, a lot of fun, you know, doing doing performance for the first time. But also, also the the, the backstage, the back of the camera, immediately interested me a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I fell in love with cinema, both sides of the camera, from this film on. But even though. Even still there, I thought I would go on. Um, I came here to Paris because I, I was at French school mm -hmm. in Portugal. Um, so I came here to the fine arts. Then, uh, then I, I I decided to I started philosophy here, uh, and and uh, even though I had done cinema, and I had a friend who. Uh, insisted that I would uh, uh, present the, the, the big, um, um, I don't know how you say in English, there's, there's um, 
big competition to you know you have to do to get into the the big uh, theater schools here uh, is it like an audition kind yeah of? but an audition of thousands of people and and he said you have to try to have to try and, and that for some miracle I got in so I, I understood that my life had changed and I that was maybe a sign that I would, should go go on with acting yeah wow and when you were in school did you take I guess acting classes and that yeah. further yeah and, and they were incredibly that. incredible interesting acting classes here at the conservatoire mm. um, it's like the main school here of acting um, so yeah I, I had started cinema it, it went on and and then I could really um, study <laughs> in a in a profound way the, that art. <laughs> well, what would you What would you say are some of the differences between American style acting versus European style, or maybe I don't know if, if I have to be more specific, French style? Yeah, I think here there's a um, especially in, in in those kind of very classical schools there's a um, a relationship to text that's almost sacred mm. and and I think it's a good thing uh, you know what they teach us here is that the actor the performer we're less than the text we, we, we shouldn't you know mm. be or trying to dominate <laughs> right. uh, 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 Shakespeare or Moliere or, you know you have try and climb up to that level okay <laughs> uh, and so there's a, a big respect of, of the text of, of uh, the way it's said mm -hmm. and um, and I thought it was a, a very um, it was a fantastic opportunity for me to be able to work with so people so different and from so many uh, origins and cultures because uh, I think I could make like a synthesis of, of um, American school um, South American school because I think in South America there's also fantastic performers mm -hmm. actors that had huge influence on me yeah. like the Brazilians and uh, and European and the, this French thing about uh, text. So I think what's interesting is is to get all those different influences and and make a synthesis. Yeah, together. One thing I would say a positive with streaming services is that it's allowing me to see actors like Brazilian shows and Mexican yeah. shows mm -hmm. and Polish shows and. Um, yeah, whereas before, yes. I wouldn't have been able to name a Polish actor and just exactly. to see their style. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and also the also, all this Slavic mm. and Eastern countries have incredible schools of cinema and, mm. and, and incredible films and performers and and also relationship to to literature mm -hmm. and all, all that is incredibly enriching yes do you think that because streaming services is making um, international acting available to everyone mm -hmm. that arts or programs or, or acting programs are being well funded as a result or well, it's always a fight to <laughs> to keep funding for a culture, and and one can ask why because it's so important. You know, it's it's really the language of peace, yeah, uh, culture. But of course, we we are still lucky here in Europe that most of you know the the biggest schools and universities are. Mm -hmm. are public and yeah. therefore available uh -huh. and I think it's one of the things we have to stick to and defend yeah my mom's a music teacher an elementary music teacher and she talks about how funding just gets slashed yes and it's year. crucial yeah 
Um, but one good thing, at least in the state of South Carolina, determined because there was a talk for a while to cut arts mm. education classes, um, but they decided that that couldn't be uh, the case. But funding gets cut. But not everyone is meant to go be a lawyer or a doctor. Some people are creatives, and they're not chal or encouraged yes. to. Maybe more so now than 60 years ago or 100 years ago to, oh, if you're creative, if you see that in a child, go chase that. Um, but yeah, it's hard to make and a living. And it's, it's, then it would be very good also if doctors and, <laughs> and lawyers, you know, could also enjoy. <laughs> yes, that's true. Because and be creative. Yeah. You know, we all creative. have to be creative. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um, so when you got the role of Fabian in Pulp Fiction, what was that like for you? Um, well, I had um, I had grown in in, uh, um, uh, in the idea of um, of cinema as being the seventh art. Uh, so, uh, really, of uh, auteur, author cinema, uh, creative cinema, and that's what I have done basically in different countries, in Portugal, uh, here in in, in France, uh, and and then I I was just out of school when um, uh, there was Phil Kaufman. Before I did Pulp Fiction, I did. The, uh, Film that was very important in my career, Henry and June. June right. Henry and June about uh, Anna Isnin and her relationship with Henry Miller, and it was Paris during, in between the wars, uh, in the 20th century, and that was an incredibly creative moment uh, here in Paris and in Europe, and uh, all those you know artists and writers from all over the world gathered here, and there were these two. Uh, Americans, uh, uh, Anna Isnin and, and Henry Miller and his wife June and there was this very intense love story between the three of them and that was that was by Philip Kaufman mm -hmm. who is a great American director uh, and it was an amazing experience, a wonderful experience and for me it was the first experience of being in an American movie and then a few years later, it, my meeting with, with Quentin was very nice, very sweet, because we really met in a tiny um, independent film festival in the south of France, in the beautiful city of Avignon. Oh, wow. And this American friend who became a friend, Jerry Rudis, ran for 25 years this independent film festival and he would he invited like all the names <laughs> that now are very important uh, in american cinema that were independent at, at the beginning nearly everybody went there and so that's how i i, I met uh, quentin he was there with his first film uh, Reservoir Dogs, mm. and I was there with the French film uh, because it was French American, yeah. and uh, and everybody was very young with no money and <laughs> and uh, all independent, creative, artistic projects, and uh, we had a very nice, uh, you know, cinephile yeah. uh, meeting. We became friends and. And then I saw him again in a much bigger festival in, in uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, and he had seen uh, Henry and June. Yeah. Uh, actually, he took the same actresses, uh, he, um, uh, Uma Thurman and me. Wow. Uh, and um, so, yeah, that was the way it, it happened. It, what was very touching is that I think I met Quentin in one of his first trips to Europe. Okay. Um, so he, he was still discovering very much everything, and and I think that 
he, he wrote that in Pulp Fiction, you know, because they, they talk a lot about Europe, how different it is, how, yes. how different names, they have yeah. different names. The quarter pounder. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the Big Mac and whatever. The, uh, and so it's, uh, but it was really, really an arts film. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the, when I, I remember when I read the script, I immediately thought, this is a genius. Mm. This is really something very. He's original. So original and so creative. But I remember also thinking, I want to do this. I don't know who's going to see this. <laughs> you know, because it was so original, so different, so complex. Yeah. As a writing was a big, big script, very dense, and then the whole chronological thing how difficult it was you know to, to follow, <laughs> to follow. Yeah. and so it seemed to me uh, something in incredibly uh, something very extraordinary but I, I, I did not I could not imagine that uh, with all that originality he would actually speak to the whole world and conquer the whole world's at attention and, and, and love for that film yeah, if he called, he's working on his last film, I think, right? I heard something. Um, if he if he called you to work on that film, would you work with him again? Oh, I would. I would <laughs> run back. Yeah, because he's such a he's such a nice person too. You know, he's such an intelligent uh, artist and so so accurate um, what he writes, and, and he's a very good writer. Yeah. And actually, it was not that different from what I had known before in the sense he's a very complete artist and, uh, uh, and you know I think the writing is, is not many people talk about that but I think it, 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 it is a signature a very important signature he's, he's, he's absolutely personal and good writing mm -hmm. and I think it's simple stuff like in watching um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, or even Pulp Fiction, just you're sitting there having a conversation exactly. about the differences between Europe yeah. and the U.S. How many times have many people all over the world had just simple conversations like yeah, that? And it's true. And you don't, I guess, to be a good writer for for cinema, I'm guessing. You just take simple life situations. You don't have to think, oh, I've got to create this world of flying cars <laughs> exactly. and aliens and this. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. Life. Yeah, yeah. He, he 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 talks from a very humane uh, uh, and and concrete level that we can identify immediately. And I think that's why you know people often say. Oh, he's so incredibly violent, and actually, he's not more violent. Uh, most of big Hollywood films are much more violent. Yeah, much more violent. But, but what makes it violent? It's because you are having like a conversation with a friend. So you you are watching the movie and identifying with that conversation, and in that conversation that you can relate to mm -hmm. as day to day. Someone comes yes. <laughs> and, uh, and and shoots you, yeah. <laughs> and then you say, "No, no, that can't be happening," and and that is very important because he makes violence much more our empathy, I mean, much more brutal to us because we are identifying with the characters. We're not seeing them as as completely strange creatures right. uh, that we don't have nothing to do with. That's true. You're drawn in. Yeah. Uh, like Kill Bill, you're you're wanting Uma Thurman's character to get her son yeah. back and uh, by whatever means necessary. Um, I think you have to appreciate cinema um, to not see it as violence or his art as violence. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I saw in an interview you did with Euronews where you said Paris uh, is a city that still helps artists and leads in cultural production. Do you still feel that Paris is that Yes, way? so far so good. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no doubt. I mean, yeah. This is the city to come to 
if you're a creative, would you say, in Europe? Yeah, it's certainly one of them. And the, the offer here of, uh, of culture and arts is, is, is very impressive. And when you see like what's happening now with uh, Anatomy of, of a Fall. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen it yet. Ah, it's, it's a very good movie. Um, but they, they, it's really a fruit of, of the French uh, system of help, state help to movies, and um, it's so important that it remains. And uh, because if you look at art history, you know artists always had <laughs> state yeah. help. I mean, how do you yeah. do? Rome. Yeah. <laughs> How do you do the Vatican without state help? Yeah. Um, so it, it, it is very important to 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 preserve that. Yeah, and I would I feel the Italians really led in that for many centuries. Yeah, because princes were funding mm -hmm. or families were funding art. Yeah, and 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 often yeah, the highest levels of state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, hopefully we don't lose sight of that with oh, um, hopefully not. countries uh, funding um, the arts in their co because we all need to, for me, being able to unwind after a long day is coming home, showering, putting on my PJs and watching a film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would hate for that to, <laughs> to end. Um, do you enjoy acting or directing more? I enjoy both and I, I enjoy especially the transition, the going from one to to the other, because um, somehow my acting experience was in a fabulous school, you know, to be able to see so many different um, directors, different, um, uh, you know, um, economies also of, of production, you know, I did big films, I did very artistic small mm -hmm. films and, and uh, again different languages and, and perspectives um, it's it's fantastic to absorb to all that and be able to somehow then go behind the camera and, and, and give something of my vision yeah mm -hmm. I, I'm sure it's a lot more work directing a lot more work <laughs> to be the actor yes you're absolutely <laughs> right it is a lot more work and uh, and when you finish a film and, and you're called to be an actor again it's like oh so cool <laughs> yeah. I remember in college uh, someone asked a professor is it easier being the student to take the exam or being the professor to grade the exam and my professor's like it's harder to be the professor to grade the exam mm. versus being the student to mm. take it because she would she said I read or I read everybody's yes. uh, essays yes. first yes. and some essays are very long <laughs> five yeah, yeah, six pages work, yeah. and then I have to go back and reread mm. again so because I need to get an idea of where the class is and then I can go back and grade so yeah, yeah, I guess directing is like that yeah, and uh, when Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt were asked the same question, they're like, oh, we're going to stick with acting. It would have to be a project that we feel, or they were speaking respectively, that you know, I'm the only one, I, or I feel that I would be the only one who could could tell that story for me to be able to take it but I'm going to leave the directing and, and acting to Bradley Cooper we'll just be actors. so um, I can imagine so my last question is uh, which projects are you working on now if you're able to share? yes um, I'm finishing as an actress uh, here a, a French film called Le Roi Soleil okay. by Vincent Maël Cardona it's it's very interesting script and I'm beginning in a few days in Portugal a uh, um, Spanish film mm -hmm. called La Quinta and it's it's nice because it's completely different we're here we were shooting in, in, in studio and pretty dark film in the sense you know with some violent scenes and, 
and the next one will be in countryside <laughs> garden <laughs> nice. and, and much more contemplation yeah. and then uh, back to the rehearsals with uh, Bob Wilson okay. this show in Florence okay. in Italy about a very important Portuguese author one of the most known uh, Fernando Pessoa okay. and so yeah and then I'm 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 working on my next um, project as a director and it's a a, a true story a biopic about um, a Portuguese woman um, that came from a very conser conservative family in Portugal you know that Portugal until 74 was the longest um, fascist uh, dictatorship in I didn't realize that. yeah 48 years uh, in Europe mm -hmm. and and we had a terrible 13 year long colonial war okay. in Angola Mozambique Guinea mm -hmm. so huge uh, territories at war mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we had this this uh, in revolution that is absolutely uh, original uh, in seventy four. So fifty years ago, mm -hmm. uh, just we had this revolution that had is completely original and different from all others because it was a military coup. It was called the Carnation Revolution. I did my first film. My first film is about it. Um, April Captains. Um, so these young military guys uh, did the coup. They managed to do it. They didn't kill anybody. No violence at all. And and they put a civilian democracy. Wow. <laughs> and they didn't take the power. Anyway, but during that dictatorship. Um, this woman was coming from the people who were ruling and, and, and so very, very dark and, and, and very fascist. And, <laughs> <laughs> and she, um, because she married a diplomat, she went to Cuba oh. and, and completely fell in love with uh, Che Guevara and revolution <laughs> in Cuba. <laughs> so, uh, it's about that her. Sounds exciting. Yeah, because th there's so much contrast in her life. And you're playing her. No, no, I'm okay. writing. I, okay. I won't be playing her. Okay, that's when yeah, you're directing. Yeah. Wow, that mm -hmm. must have taken a lot of research time. A lot, and I'm, I still am researching. Wow, it, it, and it's been years of preparing for that, I would imagine. Yeah, it's always pretty long to prepare, but for me, it takes maybe even longer because I do a lot of other stuff yeah. <laughs> as an actress but yeah that's what I'm preparing now maybe you call Quentin to act in your <laughs> film <laughs> he's a very good actor <laughs> yeah it, it's interesting like in Django I was like is that Quentin Tarantino <laughs> acting in <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah thank you so much thank you it was time. a pleasure Good for me too <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed this podcast episode and that you have found a soulful connection to the conversation. God bless you, and until the next episode, go bless somebody else. <laughs>